All right. Uh, we're going to get started with this session, which focuses on can we harmonize metadata? And to start the session, we have Michelle Dumontier, who recently moved from Stanford to Maastricht, uh, has been a co-chair of the Healthcare and Life Sciences W3C group, and the founder of the bio to rdf work, uh, which is using semantic web technologies and all kinds of open source things. So I'll let Michelle take it from here. Okay. And we'll have time for a few questions at the end of each presentation, and then we'll have a discussion with the panel after that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, to be in a community that I have never really been part of. And I think the, the rationale here is quite clear. The work that you are doing, uh, for the most part, is also very similar to the work that many other communities are doing. And so this topic that I will tell you about, the FAIR principles, really is a global call to arms for us to get together and figure out how to solve interoperability and reuse uh, problems that we all face. So I haven't made my own data set. Uh, I'm a bioinformatician bio, uh, and a biochemist by training. I haven't made my own data sets for at least 10, 15 years. I use other people's data. Uh, and I'm curious, how many people in this room use other people's data? Yeah. This is um, 10, 15 years ago, using other people's data was practically unheard of. Uh, it was actually very, very difficult. And you'd have to be a close collaborator to use somebody else's data. But now, it's much easier to, to find content on the web, download it, process it, and do something interesting with it. And just as an example, uh, Pravesh Khatri at Stanford had been working on a, a project to find um, gene signatures that would help us understand why transplants are rejected. And what he wanted to do was build this meta-analytical framework that would use gene expression data from GEO and try to build a signature of genes that were um, strongly related to organ transplant rejection. And so what he did was he grabbed a bunch of data sets um, from heart, from kidney, from liver, and lung. And what they gave him, at least an initial, is, is the contribution of any one gene to this process robust across these different tissues? So instead of just looking at heart or liver or lung, putting it together says, I can find something that is maybe fundamental to all of these different organs. But secondly is once you build uh, such a, uh, an analytical framework and you look and you build a signature, then what he ended up doing was um, targeting this gene signature with drugs that would counter the gene expression uh, profile of those genes. So gene, turn some genes off when they were on and vice versa. And what they found was that they, the signature correlated with the extent to graph injury and could predict future injury to graph. And also that mice that were treated with drugs that countered this signature could extend graft survival. So this is really cool. This is nice science. Uh, and this is what we hope would, ex would happen. That never really was demonstrated in any of the original studies, really. Only by combining these data could this finding be made. OK, but the problem, and I think what brings us into this room, is that a lot of effort is actually needed to get that figure. Right? So it's about not only finding the right data sets, but then processing them in a way that you can easily reuse them. And this is perhaps really well <laughs> exemplified by if you look at gene expression in Omnibus and you look at some of the characteristic fields that are used to describe the tissues of the samples that were analyzed, one of those might be the age of the sample. Right? And there are at least, as far as we found, 31 different ways to specify age or age has been specified in samples, not, not even looking at the values, like what they put in the value field of that key, which can be not only numeric, but all kinds of literals. So it's just the wild west of any anybody gets to put anything they want to describe their samples. So you can imagine that if you're trying to find a data set that that fulfills a particular set of criteria, you're gonna be challenged to find all of the data sets, for one, but secondly, because of even errors in coding, you're gonna find things that are just not correct, but have been erroneously introduced. Now, age is just one of about 17,000 different keys that are specified, although we expect that maybe there are about 1,000 or 1,200 real variables in play, but you would never be able to find exactly what you're looking for. So I think part of the problem is that the way that we do science is for the paper, 
<laughs> right? So we collect data, we do our analysis, and we write our narrative, and we publish our paper to tell this story, and the data is kind of our byproduct, like go look at the supplementary materials. And I think if you treat content in this way, then obviously the quality is going to suffer, right? So I think what we have to do is kind of change the natures that put the data first and then write the narrative around that. And, and because if you do that, then you can not only use it to do your analysis, but to, to be able to reproduce somebody else's work, to validate your own work with other people's data, and to generate new hypotheses like what Pravesh did in his study. Okay, so if we're ever gonna realize the full potential of the content we create, then we have to find ways to reduce the barrier to publish and define and reuse digital content, but in a responsible manner. So why does, this, why does this matter, right? So at least we know that we can enable new science doing it, but I think it's more substantial than that. So John Ioannidis has been studying the problem of reproducibility uh, for some time, and he sort of made the statement quite, you know, over 10 years ago, most published research findings are false. <laughs> which catches a lot of us by surprise. But actually, when people start looking into this and have been looking, developing um, reproducibility studies in major, um, by, of major landmark stu studies, we see that 39 out of 100 landmark studies in psychology uh, are, are reproducible, um, only 21% in pharmacology, and then only 11% in cancer. So actually, the problem of reproducibility is a little bit more substantial than we might want to admit. And this, there are lots, lots of reasons for this, everything from um, um, sort of uh, the study design to the inadequate descriptions of the components in that study uh, to the findings themselves not matching up with what was published. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, why I think this really matters is because we spend a lot of time and effort trying to develop new therapeutic treatments for people. And this, I think, is an ethical issue, is are we running clinical trials that will inherently fail? And what we're finding is that even though we're accumulating more and more knowledge and we think we're doing this better and better, our clinical trials are failing more often. So they're not actually reducing. Now, it's not like our rate of clinical trial success is increasing, it's just the opposite. So actually, I think there's an ethical dilemma to the way that we're doing science, specifically in the context of translational science. Okay, so I think we have to fundamentally rethink how we do discovery science. We obviously need to improve our confidence in any one given result, and I think we can do this in two ways. One is we can use more data, right, and this helps us build confidence about the individual result that we had, but I think we can also use multiple lines of evidence that helps us convince us that that effect truly does occur. And I think the grand challenge, at least as far as my research program is concerned and many others, is how can we automatically uncover this evidence uh, that would potentially support, uh, support or potentially dispute a hypothesis using all available data, tools, and knowledge? That should be our grand challenge. That's in some sense what we're working towards. And when we talk about interoperability, and we're talking about standards, of course it's useful for people to find that content and to reuse it, but ultimately, and at the end of the day, it's going to be an infrastructure that we need for people and for machines. So we have to, and we have been doing this, is building a social, a legal, and technological infrastructure to facilitate discovery and reuse of digital resources, but I think we have to do it a little bit more um, seriously than we have in the past. So why machines, right? So people are obviously super important in this equation, but I'll give you two arguments for machines. I think first, machines can make a sense of a vast amount of information far beyond what we can, um, and to make personalized and evidence-based pr uh, predictions or decisions to maximize outcomes. And I think we see a lot of these ideas coming out in a variety of different fields. This is one for cardiology, where the idea is to take information from hospital, inf uh, hospital data, environmental data, biobank data, lifestyle data, uh, our general knowledge about biology and biochemistry, and to put all of this simultaneously into some kind of feature matrix from which we will set machines on fire to learn patterns that are really too subtle for us to distinguish and to predict these for individuals. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> the other part, which I think you can see these discussions ongoing, is the issue of bias, right? People themselves are biased, and we're seeing the machines are learning from the people. So the question is, can we build predictive machines that are unbiased or relatively less biased than people? And I think that certainly can be the case. <clears throat> so this really brings us to this idea of FAIR, right? So for all of this content, 
for, for machines and for people to make use of other people's content, we have to take some steps to make that available. So FAIR stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable. And it's a set of principles that we developed uh, to enhance the value of all digital resources so they become easier to find and reuse. But it's not just for data sets, but also for web services, for repositories, for so software and publications. And I think part of the staying power of this idea of FAIR is because it's been developed and endorsed by a, a large number of stakeholders, that it's not just the, the geeks and the informaticians in the room, but actually involving st uh, stakeholders like funders and industry partners and publishers as part of the equation. And so we've seen some really nice uptake. It's, uh, the FAIR principles have been endorsed by the G20, the European Open Science Cloud, uh, Horizon 2020, NIH, uh, and many other uh, organizations. And even here in Canada, Canary, which is one of the uh, one of the organizations that have layered, uh, uh, put the, uh, uh, the optical cable from coast to coast have also sort of said, you know, when we give you money, we expect you to do, um, to, to, to follow the FAIR principles. So what, so what exactly are the FAIR principles? So we published this paper. We put this little box in. <clears throat> you see there are four principles and then 15 sub-principles. And it basically comes down to this. Okay, so the first, from a findable perspective, um, we ask for globally unique, resolvable, and persistent identifiers, that there be machine-readable descriptions to support structured search and filtering. So this is a little bit of when we were talking about Pervesh's case where you're trying to search through geo data sets and you want to filter those results according to a set of characteristics, you want to do that in the easiest way possible. You need structured content to help you do that. <clears throat> From an accessible perspective, we ask that the metadata is accessible well beyond the lifetime of the digital resource. So we recognize that some data sets, particularly in imaging data, are very large and are, in some cases, streaming data. And we can't necessarily hold on to all the data. But if you use that content, then you need a description of that content to refer to. And that we should be able to, uh, to make available. The second is also that uh, we define uh, a clearly defined access and security protocols. And so here, the main idea is that a lot of the content that, that certainly I deal with as a biomedical researcher is patient data. And it's clear that we can't make patient data uh, directly available to people. We can't make it open. So what FAIR asks you is to, if you have content that is sensitive, then you and your organization need to come up with a procedure by which that content can be made available. And you should specify what that is for other people to be able to follow it as well. So that might mean you need to get review board, institutional review board approval, you need to uh, sign a data usage agreement, there might be a number of steps that you need to follow, and you, that needs to be clearly articulated. From the interoperable perspective, we expect then um, exten extensible machine interpretable formats for data and metadata. Um, and to use fair vocabularies and to link to other resources. So here, this is an interesting sort of dependency, is if you say, yes, I use a vocabulary, um, and then the question is, is it fair? So is it easy to find? Can we access it? Is it interoperable with other vocabularies? And does it have licensing and other kinds of information that will let me reuse it? So now you get to push back on the people who provide you with the vocabulary and say, are you also being fair? And you have the mandate as part of your own assessment that this, uh, this is needed. The other linking part is also that we don't create data silos, right? That content that you push out also is interlinked with other content that is already available. And then finally, from the reusable perspective, then you provide clear licensing terms, you uh, provide a detailed provenance, and also that you use community standards um, we have been hearing a lot about community standards, and this is the push for you. So the idea, the hypothesis, is that improving the fairness of digital resources will increase their quality and their potential and ease of reuse. So my argument here is not that if you do, if you follow these fair principles, everybody's going to come knocking at your doorstep and say, this is awesome and I want to use your data, but more that if there's even one person that wants to use your data, it's easy for them to do that. So it's not a popularity contest. It's really that the barrier is lower. And so fairness, when I saw that, and when I talk about this, is a quality that really reflects the extent to which a digital resource meets the FAIR principles or addresses them, but as per the expectations of the community. Okay, so why is this important? We imagine that people will do fairness assessments. They will assess how fair or what, ex what steps have you taken to make your content fair. And that will be reflected in search engines. You might see something like this. This is a mock-up for the Dan search engine, mostly of social sciences uh, data sets. 
And they have a little insignia, uh, which has the F, A, I, and R, and you can see different star levels there. And so you can imagine that if you were doing a search, that if all other things were being the same, your ranking of your search result would sort of indicate here are all the data sets that match it. But if people had made some extra efforts to make sure that they were reusable by, other, by, by that community, then you might choose that data set over others. So this is where we will see a differentiation of if you follow the FAIR principles and you enact on it, then people will start to choose your content because it's easier for them to reuse. So the question is, really communities such as this one have to make clear what your expectations are. What do you expect from your colleagues and your peers? What must they do for it to be easy for you to reuse? And FAIR is the, the thing that you can push in front of people and say, we need to do it, right? We need to set our own standards and we need to follow it. And so this is exactly what we see when we look at the citations of this paper. And many of these are discussions amongst communities sort of establishing what tools and infrastructure and processes and procedures they have in order to meet the FAIR principles. We have also been working on infrastructure to try to do this assessment of fairness, right? You can look at the principles and the principles just tell you they're aspirational. They tell you what should be there, but they don't really tell you how to do it. There are lots of ways to, to meet the FAIR principles. So the question is, how do we measure whether or not you've addressed these things, like you've provided a, a per persistent identifier, or you've used a community standard, or you have a licensing term that everybody understands? So we developed this, we're trying to develop a framework to do this, and we want to measure it through a set of metrics. And so metrics are standards of measurement. They, in our, in our templates, they have to provide um, a very clear definition of what's being measured and why one wants to measure it. They have to describe what a valid result is and how one obtains it so that it can be reproduced by others. Um, so recently we published this paper which is called the Design Framework for Example and Exemplar Metrics for Fairness. And this has a set of 14 universal metrics that cover each of the FAIR sub-principles. And they basically demand evidence uh, from, your, from your community, from you and your community, in which some of them may require new actions that you don't have. So let me give you some of the set. So digital resource providers must provide a web accessible document. So this is typical metadata, uh, and many of you produce metadata as part of a repository where you deposit your data set or your, your software. Um, this has to be machine readable metadata. It has to detail your identifier management strategy and your metadata longevity strategy. So these are in your data management plan of you or the organization that you're using or the system you're using to, to, to make that content available and any of these additional authorization procedures that might be required to access the content, so the security issue. You also have to use other people, uh, standards that are developed by the community. So you can't say, I built a new standard and here's my data in my own format, <laughs> uh, but really it has to be, have gone through some kind of community uh, process. So these we expect to be publicly registered, uh, so that includes identifier schemes, so imagine DOIs or URLs, things like that. Um, uh, secure access protocols like HTTP, HTTPS, for instance, knowledge representation languages like JSON-LD or, uh, or XML or whatever it is, um, uh, licenses uh, that are available out there, um, different provenance specification languages, and community standards. So um, these are things that you have to develop and you have to register. And then finally, you have to provide evidence of the ability to find that digital resource in search results uh, that is, uh, provides links to other resources, that those linked resources are fair themselves, and that you meet community standards. So uh, I and many others have developed um, uh, a standard for uh, dataset metadata. It's called the HLS um, Community Profile for Dataset Descriptions. And we did this through the World Wide Web Consortium. And we built this, uh, it took us like two years. <laughs> and we talked about different kinds of metadata elements that we thought were important in including to describe a data set in healthcare and life sciences. And there's a beautiful HTML document uh, that gives you examples and, and so on that you can follow and create uh, this, this compatible thing. But to be fair, I needed to register this standard, which was, even though it was published in, through the W3C, I added it to the fair sharing uh, repository. And it required me to fill in certain kinds of metadata about a standard, right? So this is where I even had to make an action to be fair with respect to that. And the second part is also that this description, right, which was an HTML document, easy for people to understand, but really hard for us to validate whether you met the standard at all. 
So there we built, um, uh, so we used this shape expressions constraint language, developed a specification for our, uh, our computable specification, and then now you can prepare a document and submit it and get a validation report and say here's what you've passed and here's where you're falling short. So we need to be able to certify that you've met the community standard, whatever that is. And that means that, commu that community standard needs to be computationally accessible. Okay, so we made a first assessment uh, using these metrics. Uh, we asked a number of different repositories to uh, fill out this questionnaire, provide us with URLs or yes or no answers. So we asked uh, Dataverse, Dryad, uh, this Nano Publication Network, Zenodo, uh, the Yale system, Figshare, uh, Wikidata, and they filled in their, uh, the questionnaire and they provided us with uh, uh, URIs, which are basically two pointers, two documents, uh, on the web uh, that uh, comply with these fair metrics. And you can see the green boxes show you they gave us something and it's exactly what we were looking for. The yellow boxes, it gave us something, but it wasn't quite what we were looking for. And the red boxes are they didn't give us anything at all or they gave us something and it was wrong, okay. So you can see actually there's pretty good discrimination. We see you know, about half of them are green boxes. We have about a third or a quarter or so are red boxes. So that means that, uh, which is good, we expect that not everybody will have satisfied all the requirements, otherwise we wouldn't even have this discussion, right? That there's still work to be done. Uh, but it's not so devastating that nothing has been done, right? So there's just enough work uh, for us to build on. And what's really interesting is that we've gone uh, through BioIT world and had these hackathons and we've asked people in the course of 24 hours to do a fairness assessment of the resource at the start. So here we had uh, the C Bio portal, the Jack's, Jack's team had a data set, the Broad had a uh, single cell data set, and there's the bioassay from EBI. And they did a fairness assessment. 24 hours later, they, they looked, we, we told them what are the fair principles, what do you gotta do? And they picked some things and they could improve it in the course of 24 hours. So it also tells you that we can improve the state of the art uh, in a relatively short period of time. Maybe not to the totality of 100% um, uh, scoring here, but we're, it's, it's doable. So now we're also building systems to do automated fair, fairness assessments. And so I think part of what we learned was that um, what people thought we were asking for was different than what they thought we were asking for. And we need to standardize a little bit about what that is. And the question is, can we have machines automatically do fairness assessments? So we've started to do this. I'm building infrastructure to, to do this, to retrieve content, to do fairness assessments. But one of the problems that we found is that um, the content that people provided us before, which was iffy, is now uns is absolutely not good enough for the machines. And even things that we had previously agreed was good enough, the machine says it's not good enough. So these assessments are pretty f unforgiving, and I think this uh, will be problematic for some time until we figure it out. Nonetheless, all of this work we are doing through the uh, NIH Data Commons pilot phase uh, where we're building infrastructure to do fairness assessments. And that's not just the, the, again, the questionnaires and the filling out the values, but also bringing that up through applications and showing you different kinds of insignias that show you how fair your resources are. I'd like to also mention the, um, there was an expert group um, uh, of the European Commission uh, was tasked to write a report on turning fair data into reality. They have a number of different recommendations. This uh, includes uh, cross-disciplinary fairness, encouraging and incentivizing data reuse, and facilitating automated processing. And so again, like Ferris is telling you what you should achieve, but how do we get there? And I think that also includes um, you know, data science and stewardship skills and all additional training and, and curriculum development, which we are starting to do through the context of this uh, Global Open Fair Initiative, or GoFair. GoFair is really meant to be a grassroots uh, initiative. We will be focusing on three different things. One is on Go Build, which is basically technical infrastructure for doing uh, fair work, uh, training networks, and as a, also this cultural change that is required to embrace this, uh, this thing. While there are uh, networks for metabolomics, uh, for training, uh, for rare diseases, uh, also there was some talk about maybe having something for neuro, uh, neuroscience, neuroinformatics, and I think that'd be a great place uh, for this discussion to go. Right, so in summary, I, I hope I've convinced you that FAIR uh, represents now a global initiative to enhance the discovery and reuse of all kinds of digital resources. This FAIR concept is maybe maturing faster than we expected, 
but also there are plenty of avenues for you to participate in if you think this is important. Uh, and I think it's important because ultimately you'll end up being assessed based on what you and your communities decide are the standards that are expected from you. So you should participate. I think there are huge benefits to be had. Um, I think there are two, two aspects we're having discussion during lunch where uh, you have to think about it that for the most part, if you're just a data producer and you're producing content for other people, I mean, that's very altruistic. But I think you should be thinking, how do I, as an individual, make use of other people's data? And do I have the skills to do that? So many, there are many young people in this crowd. This is what you should be making sure that you uh, can capitalize on this emerging uh, phenomenon. And also that machines will eventually automatically process a lot of this content uh, and uh, that, that, that can open up new opportunities for discovery. And then finally, it demands really a new social, uh, legal, uh, and technological infrastructure uh, that really doesn't exist in whole. It has parts, and we've, we've heard a lot about that this morning, but we need to put it together so it makes sense, and also that it's ethical with respect to our expectations. Lots and lots of people involved in, in uh, both FAIR, uh, the FAIR metrics. We have lots of support from funding agencies and organizations. Uh, around the world, which is great, and uh, we expect uh, a lot more developments to occur, and hopefully uh, with you. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you for your talk, and I think it was a great uh, overview of the of all affair. Um, I want to stick the hornet's nest a little bit, though. Um, and I think in the community, the community, neuroinformatics community, has worked a lot on standards and inter interoperability, and understands the importance of that. I think in in general, um, and we also, I think, have a sense of sort of the costs and benefits that come with this. Your talk different than a lot of other ones, had the words must and need to, and like the search engine page you had, you said people will look at this and decide whether to use your data or not. And that sounds like to make must happen, there's either carrots or sticks, because otherwise it's best practices. And I think sure. you know, we've embraced best practices as much as possible. Yeah. Um, is there, what, if, what is the sense of the carrots and sticks that make this happen, that make must happen? Yeah, right. So I think one of the biggest ones is the, the commitment of funding agencies, certainly in Europe, uh, with respect to data management plans. Uh, in particular for the Horizon 2020 programs, I think the expectation will be 5% of your overall budget will be allocated to research data management. And also in your research data management plan, you must clearly address how you are addressing the FAIR principles in your data management plan. So these will be part of review, and they're also part of the funding strategy. So this, I think, is to really show that this activity of research data management is not a research activity, and it's something that we expect that we will have a, uh, and I think our, the plan is to train data stewards uh, to, to participate in this. And I think, in my opinion, data, you know, good data, responsible data science involves um, data stewardship. So young people should certainly understand what that means. But there, will, there should be funding also allocated to make sure that you can delegate this task to, to others to do. So I think that part is, is, uh, uh, is quite popular amongst funding agencies, and that will happen. But I mean, the other, you're right, that the other is the stick part, like the journals having to require particular formats or endorsements by you know, communities. But uh, as, as I was mentioning, I think the most powerful incentive is can you, can you make use of your data in a different context? Can you do this meta-analysis an to learn something that you can't from the single data that you had? And that, that you know, the insight that you could potentially derive from uh, integrating other people's data is probably the most powerful motivator to do it well because otherwise it won't fit in your pipeline. You, you won't be able to reuse it. So this is what we're doing at Maastricht University. We have a, a pilot project now to couple research data management with e-science uh, across all the, six, all the six disciplines that we have there. Uh, and it's a super interesting uh, exercise where we talk to social scientists and they go, what data? Uh, you know, like they do qualitative kind of assessments and things like that. 
whereas we have others, especially in the neuroinformatics community, who have monstrously large you know, MRI data sets, and they've been doing this for a long time. And they sort of say, again, how do I couple that now with the electronic healthcare record data in the hospital, along with the data that I'm collecting here with the, the patient? So I think there's good opportunities to, uh, to uh, that the incentive is discovery is the biggest one. And then the second is financial uh, compensation for these activities. Yeah. So while we take the next question, maybe I can ask Jeff to come up and set up. Yep. Hi. Thank you for this uh, talk. Um, so, so that automatic fairness assessment uh, system that you've presented, um, is it based on basically self-report? Is that how it's, it's meant to work? Yeah, so the, the first one uh, that we did was a self-report. And then we also did our own assessment, so an expert assessment. Uh, and then we tried to jive the differences between the two by having conversations to learn about whether our questionnaire was clear enough, or whether what we were asking was clear enough, or whether they fundamentally didn't have that information at all. The automated assessment, I think, is that leap forward, which is, um, are you providing that content in a way that is easy for us to find uh, and automatically discover? Uh, and there, I think we will provide additional guidelines for people to publish this. And particularly, this will matter for repositories uh, that, that take in your data, let's say, and make it part of a searchable engine, then what other things can they do to make it very clear, either through the submission process of additional content, like what license do you want to release this under, um, and, and present it to uh, these FAIR assessor uh, tools in a standard way. But, but basically, for the system to work, the particular database or a data set will have to provide you with information, with metadata about like what licenses they, they use right. and whether yeah, the findability so, is also... Yeah, so that's what I kind of mentioned is like um, there needs to be public registration of those resources that you're pointing to. So if you're using a license that's a standard license, we expect it to be registered in a place where standard licenses are registered. If you use a um, data format that is a recognized community data format, then it should be in a repository where recognized community data formats are. So it will require the registration of a shared resource in order for these fair assessments to go on. You can't just build your own thing anymore. That's a big difference. And, and not, not tell the world that you've done it. OK, thanks. Yeah. We can discuss it after if you want. Hi. Um, I have a question about the HCLS standard that you mentioned. and um, so. Um, so since the session is called um, Can Metadata Be Harmonized, um, how does the, that particular standard relate to the other ones that have been mentioned today, right. like BIDS, NIDM, DCAT, PROV? Sure. Um, yeah. It, is it, how, does it, how is it different and what yeah. kind of harmonizing yeah, is exactly. possible? So, so, so part of our exercise was really um, uh, to actually uh, survey existing vocabularies uh, and see how we could provide a guideline to the use of those vocabularies for specific metadata needs. So actually, we didn't, we didn't create any new vocabulary. We just made a guide of how to use other, uh, these existing vocabularies to, to describe, to, 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 to provide metadata in a computational way. So maybe different. Uh, it, it was one of the few where, have you ever seen that picture? People often put this picture where there's 14 standards, and then somebody makes a new standard for all the other standards. So here it was just basically, let's use the 14 standards available. And here's the guideline for you, the user, who doesn't want to sift through 14 standards, but really just says, I want, I have this task, how do I get it done? And I think we should probably need to do more of this is just to guide people to just get, get it done. And then the interoperability thing is something that uh, we push back on the developers of, of these vocabularies and ontologies and sort of say, how are you interoperable with the other vocabularies that are out there? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I, I was wondering, is there any way in the, in the FAIR metrics, I guess, maybe principles, but most likely metrics, to, to have some specific criteria for subfields or subdisciplines? Because I can, I mean, it's great to have general principles that apply, you know, across disciplines, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I can see that, that you know, specific niches would, would, would like to say, you know, 
for instance, your metadata doesn't have any value unless you share this particular piece of information yeah. Yeah. and conversely. And you know, the, the fact also that it's, it's being picked up by funding agencies is great, but I also can see a risk that if the framework is too rigid, you know, we would end up with normative metrics that may not fit yeah. all the use cases. Yeah, no, I think this is a great, uh, great question. Um, so the way that I see it is that the FAIR principles are broader than any one community standard. So the idea is, uh, and as described by FAIR principles, community standards can be, um, are, are part of that. So if you have very specific uh, elements of data or metadata or whatever it is, um, and that's something that you and your community agree to, that's something you can specify, but it's in addition to what we provide as with a core set of, of expectations. So in, in no way does this replace existing community standards. It just augments them with a, with, in a sort of in a principled manner uh, as to what we should expect from all communities, wherever they may be. But what if you have more specific requirements, then it's up to you to build these community standards, again, that are machine understandable community standards that we can process with them and we can scale with the number of, of data elements that are out there. And that's where we would start to push back and say, is your community standard fair? Uh, let's thank Michelle and thank you. Thank you.